from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the south. I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Last minute preparations are being held across Brazil on the eve of the runoff elections. Electoral officials have distributed the electronic voting machines to poll stations. In the country's largest city, Sao Paulo, workers loaded voting machines onto vehicles to transport them from government offices to local poli polling sites. Brazilians will go to the polls after the most polarizing presidential race in decades. There are 531 voting machines that go from here to 29 polling stations in the jurisdiction of Sao Paulo. These machines were loaded two weeks ago, and today they are being escorted to the polling stations and remain under continuous guard by the military police. This until the voting starts at 8 a.m. on Sunday. Over 200,000 people rallied in Salvador de Bahia on Friday night in support of Workers' Party candidate Fernando Haddad. The Workers' Party candidate told the crowd he's ready to win on Sunday. Haddad spoke about his opponent, Jair Bolsonaro, saying he's using money from businessmen to spread fake news. And on Saturday, Fernando Haddad received a warm welcome from his hundreds of supporters in Heliopolis, Sao Paulo. This is Haddad's final campaign event in a highly contested race. Recent polls have shown Haddad has managed to close the gap between his opponent, Jair Bolsonaro. He has continued to call on the support of all Democrats in the country. I have already invited all Democrats to be with me. Everyone knows publicly and even privately that I have invited all Democrats to be with me because I feel that Bolsonaro is a great institutional risk. Our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Ignacio Lemus, has more details. We are in Heliopolis outside of Sao Paulo. These are crucial moments for democracy just hours ahead of the run of elections. There is a march for peace and democracy in this community. Hundreds of people are marching in support of Workers' Party presidential candidate Fernando Haddad. Tomorrow, millions of Brazilians will have to decide between the left-wing candidate Haddad, who leads a democratic front, or far-right candidate Jair Bolsonaro from the Social Liberal Party, who is a former army captain and who wants to return the country to a military dictatorship like in 1964, and who also wants to continue a neoliberal project full of austerity measures like the government of current president, Michel Temer. The destinies of close to 150 million Brazilians truly rests within their own hands. Liberal Social Party candidate Jair Bolsonaro strongly backs the use of anti-terror laws against social movements. He has also made it clear that he will not condone any form of social activism. On the other hand, Workers' Party candidate Fernando Haddad promises to introduce new agrarian and urban reforms. He also guarantees equal representation of all people. Bolsonaro's supporters agree with his proposed suppression of social movements. There has to be better regulations, because we can continue like this. Invasions carried out by these groups are wrong. Anyone who chooses to invade another person's private property is wrong. That is simple level. In a video message, Bolsonaro said he would wipe off the map persons he described as red criminals. He was referring to social and labor organizations. Political analysts warned that the relationship between Bolsonaro and the business elite could have a serious impact on workers' rights. Businessmen are financing fake news. They are essentially enabling the dismantling of labor rights and that is why they consider Bolsonaro a strong ally. He is a candidate without limits. He will persecute his opponents. He will silence human rights activists. He will persecute any worker who will try to defend his rights. She was a political prisoner during the Brazilian civil military dictatorship. Now Solange Jose walks the streets of Rio de Janeiro, rallying support for Fernando Haddad and to let people know the threat that Bolsonaro represents. The Brazilian people do not know how severe a dictatorship is. I experienced it firsthand. I know what is it and that's why I am out here. 
I have been part of the teachers' union for 20 years. I had to quit my job because I needed brain surgery. This was because of the injuries I sustained from being repeatedly struck in the head during the military dictatorship. Voters have seen and heard the hateful messages Bolsonaro has sent his opponents. In addition to his son's threat to close the Supreme Court, now the destinies of millions of Brazilians truly rests within their own hands. As Brazil heads to the polls tomorrow, there are fears that a victory of Jair Bolsonaro could spell doom for democracy. To discuss this, we're joined by Gabriela Dresch, a Brazilian human rights activist. Hello, Gabriela. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you. Could you explain to us how Bolsonaro still manages to command a level of support among minorities despite his derogatory comments about these groups? This is a very complex context. We are kind of trying to understand what's going on, but it's really scary the fact of uh, there are many people supporting him and people who is uh, promising to defeat somehow. It's very scary. Now, Gabriela, Bolsonaro supporters have claimed the left is exaggerating the threat he poses to democracy and human rights. What are your thoughts on this? Um, he, all these speeches that he was saying during the years he was joining the government somehow, he was giving speeches against human rights, against women, against homosexuals, against black people. And now he's trying to change a little bit in the end of the election, saying that's not like that that he was making some kinds of jokes and that's not true. And we understand that as a very young democracy, because we had a long time a, dicta uh, a military dictatorship, it's very dangerous because all these things he supports, they are related to this period in which we, don't, we didn't have liberty, freedom. Now, it will be right to assume that Bolsonaro's views on minorities, such as women, black people, and LGBT community, are a reflection of the views of the majority of the Brazilian people? Well, now the last research about the election's intentions, we can see that there is a equal voting intention, so we don't know what's going to happen. We hope that democracy will win. And um, it's very unstable, you know. Last week he was, uh, he was about to win from the research, but now we don't know. I hope he won't. Gabriela, thank you so much for sharing all this information with us today. Thank you. Moving on. Progressive leaders from Latin America have greeted former pr Brazilian president Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva on his birthday. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro said via Twitter, Today, our Latin American brother Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva celebrates his birthday. The Bolivarian people send you a hug full of strength and hope. We fully believe that truth and justice will prevail over lies. Forza Lula. And Bolivian President Evo Morales also sent out a tweet saying, We greet our brother Lula da Silva on his birthday. Today, more than ever, we must remember everything he did for Brazil and Latin America. The millions of people he helped escape poverty are claiming for the return of Brazil's greatest president, who has been turned into a political prisoner. Meanwhile, social movements have been holding a vigil outside the prison where Lula is being held. This to celebrate his birthday. Music, poetry and words of resistance mark the celebration for Lula's birthday. With the presence of different Latin American social organizations, the people shouted, I am Lula. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. present at every event of where our nations are staring. We believe in a new global vision, united in every broadcasting. We keep expanding our horizons and working on a closer and better communication. Now, in Grenada, 
Telesur, the new source from South America and the Caribbean. Welcome back. The migrant caravan in Mexico has continued moving north despite attempts by security forces to stop it. Mexican federal police in riot gear blocked the highway about 10 kilometers outside Arriaga, Chiapas in the early hours of Saturday. Our correspondent in Mexico, Eduardo Martinez, has been following the caravan and brings us this report. This group of migrant caravans continue onward after having been detained by federal police and immigration services earlier in the day. They are headed towards the town of Tapanatepec in Oaxaca after finally leaving the state of Chiapas. They will be spending the night there and tomorrow they will continue towards Mexico City where they will try to meet with members of the Mexican Senate to ask for free and safe passage for all the migrants. Some are concerned about what lies ahead, particularly what may happen once they reach the U.S. border, given the threats by President Donald Trump, who has said that the border will be militarized so that no migrants can cross. The Mexican president announced on Friday that the government will offer migrants medical care, education for their children, and access to temporary work as long as they stayed in two southern states. To support you, the government of Mexico is launching the plan, Yeah in Your Home, while in Mexico, you can receive medical attention and even send your children to school. You will also have a temporary official identification to do the procedures that you need while you regularize your immigration status. However, the migrants have rejected the proposal as they believe that, though, that the majority of those who will apply will be rejected and deported. This is definitely a strong mandate. We all know that. It's more of the same, which is repressing, containing migration. There's no solution there. A rally in support of the migrant caravan has taken place in Honduras, but those who took to the streets were faced with police repression. Early on Friday morning, a caravan in solidarity with the Honduran migrants arrived in Tegucigalpa and they are demanding the resignation of Juan Orlando Hernandez. We couldn't remain silent. We couldn't stand idly by. We need to stand up for our brothers who were driving out of the country. Protesters walk for three days to get to Tegucigalpa. They want to return to democracy, something they say was lost after the current president was illegally re-elected. I think this is the moment for endurance, to stand up for ourselves and demand that this illegitimate government return power to the people. In the afternoon, more demonstrations were held for the same reason, to demand the resignation of Juan Orlando Hernandez but the people were met with police repression and attacked with tear gas. When we arrived, there were four army squadrons along with police. They were ready to repress us. In the wake of the attacks, they called on the international community to suspend economic support to the current government. We cover our faces so that we are not murdered tomorrow by Juan Orlando Hernandez goons, the usurper that stole the elections from Salvador Nasralla. We ask the international community to stop supporting this dictator. People are fleeing because there is no money, no opportunities in Honduras. According to reports, Honduras spends over 18 million U.S. dollars in weapons and ammunition, which is mainly used to repress protests. Meanwhile, extreme poverty has reached nearly 50 percent. A spokesperson for UNICEF has said children in the migrant caravan face violence and abuse. They said Central American children are facing a trip that's long, uncertain and full of dangers to the United States. She also called on authorities to pay attention to the risk of exploitation and violence against them.
We're urging all governments to make sure that these children have access to all of the protections that are afforded to them under international law. So that means that it's essential that all children and families are able to apply for asylum and that they are able to have their international protection rights addressed before any decision on returns or deportations are made. A historical building in Peru's capital, Lima, has caught fire. It was reportedly due to a fire in the kitchen of a restaurant in the Yacoleti building. No injuries were sustained. The building is more than 100 years old and is considered a landmark in the city. In Ecuador, a gathering to demand the freedom of former Vice President Jorge Glass has been held. Hundreds of supporters of the Citizens Revolution Movement gathered in the city of Latacunga, where Glass is in prison. They held a visual in support of the former Vice President. Leaders of the movement have said they will start a national plan of resistance against the policies applied by the current government. Thousands of families have been evacuated in Paraguay due to heavy floating. Authorities have declared a state of emergency for 90 days. Families have been relocated on, in shelters across this country. The Technological Innovation Program in Agriculture and Agroforestry in Haiti is set to invest over 660 million US dollars over the next five years to improve the lives of small farmers. Over 65,000 households should, be, should benefit as underprivileged people are said to receive the funds. Small farmers will have access to technology that harvests fruit and vegetables better. The initiative will rely on community participation as they are taught new techniques on how to use them. 30 modelers are taking part in the Urban Art Festival La Puerta del Sur in Chile. The urban festival La Puerta del Sur is taking over abandoned public spaces. This festival aims at bringing art out of museum halls and into the streets in a bit for the creation of interesting content and social criticism. The idea began with a conversation among several painters. We were painting all over the world and for different festivals. The idea with this festival is not only to paint, but to go beyond the paint and create something like what we are creating now. We are changing the visual landscape with the help of several artists that are sharing their art with the city. Thirteen muralists painted more than 1,300 meters of walls and stones of the Mapocho River in capital Santiago, a space full of symbolism and history. This river is a scar, it is a backbone in the city, but it is also a border of Santiago between the poor and the rich. This river has a lot of violence. Bodies were found here during the militia coup. My parents left for exile. The stories of the military coup, popular unity, and this river are part of my life and my childhood. The secret police of dictator Augusto Pinochet tortured and murdered people in the riverside, a painful practice that has continued. Do you remember the case of the Colombian who got killed and was thrown here? Well, this river has accumulated all that is bad with this city. What we are doing here is just returning a little bit of love to the river through street art. The Venezuelan-Chilean muralist Galala has come back to return part of that love. The mural that I came here to do represents a meeting between Venezuelan dancing demons and Chilean dancing demons. This is my way of explaining the encounter of my roots, of my history, my childhood, and all those stories that I have heard all of my life. But he's not the only one. Peruvian muralist Olfer shows his own story as well. The river has a mystique because they found an Inca mummy here, where the river begins. Above that, the Incas settled here because they reached these parts. Everyone has united for this Latin American encounter. The Chilean poet Raúl Zurita reflects through his verses that will be engraved on the murals. When everything is finished, these stones will remain. They will survive the waves, the centuries and the dreams. Just how the powerful and the stubborn hearts will last. Stubborn like these artists that on the stones of the river, they found a place to paint their best weapon. We'll take a short break now. More news in a minute.
an occasion to enjoy the cultural diversity that defines our South American essence. Come along to find out the story behind these personalities, traditions, and artistic expressions that unite us as a whole. Real Lives, Friday, only on Telesur. Enjoy our programming from Monday to Friday, where you'll find the best information on culture, innovation, conservation, human well-being. Keep up to date on the latest innovations in science and technology with Adamun. The habits and knowledge you need to live a healthy lifestyle are on Guide Your Body. Environmental consciousness is required to preserve our Earth. Undergo your transformation on Green Zone. All about equity, diversity, and respect for identities on By Gender. Cultural manifestations, the are in all its forms and the stories of Real Lives. Every day we feature a wide variety of content. Only on Telesur, the news source from Latin America and the Caribbean. Telesur brings you special interviews with social and political personalities. Monday, from Washington. Tuesday, from Mexico. Wednesday, from Caracas. Thursday, from Quito. Friday, from Havana. Analysis about our continent's reality. Weekdays, only on Telesur. Welcome back. Thousands of opposition supporters rallied in the Democratic Republic of Congo to demand the removal of electronic voting machines ahead of the elections in December. They claim the machines will be used to rig the presidential, parliamentary and provincial races. The DRC has never seen a peaceful transition of power since gaining independence from Belgium in 1960. It is a great show of strength by the Congolese people who refused the voting machine, who refused the corrupt electoral register and who won good elections. And as a leader with the people in communion, in unison we work today to say not to this electoral farce. Former South African President and Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize winner F.W. de Klerk has been hospitalized for a long condition. He's probably recovering and is expected to, dis to be discharged next week. He was the last apartheid area president and became a Nobel laureate in 1993 for having seen the transition away from apartheid. Two United Nations peacekeepers have been killed in Mali after militants launched an attack on a UN base in the north of the country. Peacekeepers based in Bear have, have replied an attack that was launched simultaneously by several trucks armed with rocket launchers and machine guns. Flash flows in southern Russia have killed six people. Russia's emergency ministry said it has recovered the bodies while cleaning the rubble. The floods have affected the parts of the Krasnodar region, including the area around the city of Sochi. At 5.40, we woke up because we heard the water at our door. In a hurry, we took what we could and put it all in the plastic garbage bags and stored it all upstairs. Now it's time to bring you some other stories from around the world. At least eight people have been killed in a shooting at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, United States. The gunman, described as a white male, is in custody. He reportedly burst into the Tree of Life synagogue shouting, all Jews must die. Three officers were also injured during the incident. Hundreds of thousands of members of Taiwan's LGBT community have marched through the capital to demand that the government deliver on its promise of allowing same-sex marriages. In May of last year, the Constitutional Court announced they had the right to legally marry. 
setting a two-year deadline for legislation. From the 24th of November, Taiwan will hold a series of public votes on the matter. Two years ago, the Constitutional Court has let same-sex marriage pass, so we were hoping that Taiwan can be the first country to legalize same-sex marriage in Asia. But after a while, we discovered that there hasn't been any particular progress on this legislation, so we feel a little bit disappointed. But we are still hoping that in the coming local elections, conservative as well as gay right groups could be part of the public voting procedure so they can decide about this issue. A four-party summit on Syria is underway in Istanbul, Turkey. Leaders from Russia, Germany, France and Turkey are discussing settling the conflict in accordance with UN Security Resolution 2254 and the return of Syrian refugees. On the agenda will also be the creation of a buffer zone in armed rebel-held Idlib province. We come to the end of this news brief. These and many other stories you can find at our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Thank you for watching. Me gustaría tener un mundo mucho más inclusivo para todos. No hay pobreza.